Good morning. I'm Harley Schlanger from the LaRouche Organization with your daily video update for May 12th, 2022. I'm going to take up two questions today. The first one is the question of, is nuclear war possible? I know there are many of you who are saying that it will never happen, it's not possible, and you're, I think, ignoring the danger of an out-of-control situation that could snowball into what would be a catastrophic accident for humanity. But the direction is very much moving in that way, and I, I want to review that for you. And then secondly, take up the question, are the transatlantic nations now in support of the Nazis? Very problematic question to look at, but one that we have to look at given the way the proxy war against Russia is continuing. So let's start with the first one. And I want to remind you of what Admiral Charles Richard, who's the head of the Strategic Command of the United States military, said in an article he wrote in February 2021. Richard wrote, quote, the U.S. military must shift its principal assumption from nuclear employment is not possible to nuclear employment is a very real possibility, unquote. Now, that's a, a very strong statement to look at, the shift away from the idea that we must have a deterrence and never use nuclear weapons. And recently, the UN Security Council Permanent Five Nations reasserted that, as did Biden and Putin in their December meeting, that nuclear war should never happen. Well, the Atlantic Council, one of the leading think tanks of the Anglo-American establishment, just published on its website a discussion on the topic, what would happen if Putin uses nuclear weapons? Now, it has all the usual narratives, starting with Putin's facing a humiliating battlefield setback and that the Russians are uh, committed to a long war, uh, a genocidal war, and so on. And their conclusions are somewhat low key. The, for example, the main conclusion is, quote, it's a likely very low chance that Putin could use nuclear weapons. But then they say it's, quote, not inconceivable, unquote. And the final word is left with Alexander Vershbaugh, who is the former Deputy Secretary General of NATO under Obama. Previously in the Clinton administration, Vershbaugh was a special assistant at the National Security Council, where he was involved in NATO's policy in the Balkans, where the U.S. and NATO bombed Yugoslavia. Then he became the U.S. ambassador to NATO. And Vershbaugh writes, quote, allies should consult now on possible response options so they are not paralyzed with indecision when crunch time comes, unquote. In other words, prepare for nuclear war. And this is the subject of the Global Thunder military exercises, which are for the last three years annual exercises of NATO, which take up this question of nuclear readiness, the preparation for nuclear response uh, in case of the escalation to nuclear war. Now, while this is going on, the question of the U.S. support for Nazis is also finally beginning to be discussed in the media, largely through denial that there are Nazis involved in Ukraine or that, that uh, ch charges that Putin is making this up as a justification for the war. But I'm sure very few of you have had access to two significant comments on May 9th, the Victory in Europe Day, the victory celebrations uh, for the surrender, commemorating the surrender of the Nazis at the end of World War II. Putin spoke at a Victory Day parade in Moscow, and he, <clears throat> he said that he was concerned that U.S. veterans who wanted to attend this celebration of Moscow were forbidden this year, unlike past years. And he said, quote, we are proud of your deeds and your contributions to our common victory. We honor all soldiers of the allied nations. And he first mentioned the Americans in that light. And he said, and all those who defeated Nazism and militarism. In his mind, 
And he has demonstrated this through some writings, and, and this is also acknowledged by a, a number of historians, that you have in Ukraine today, in the armed forces and security sector, people whose loyalties go to the Stefan Bandera units of the Waffen-SS of the Ukrainian forces in World War II. And that these are at the front lines of the assault against the Russian citizens in the Donbass. Now that same day, Scott Ritter, the former arms inspector in Iraq, a military veteran, whistleblower, issued an open letter to the American people. And he writes in that letter of the common cause of the United States and Soviet Union to defeat the Nazis in World War II. And he said, as Russia today is in a struggle against the Ukrainian heirs of the Nazi movement, today's followers of Stefan Bandera, he writes, quote, one would logically expect that the United States would be on Moscow's side, unquote, in this war. Well, as he points out, there's no logic to this. Instead, through the global NATO policy of the West, the U.S. is deploying against Russia in defense of the Ukrainian Nazis inside their nation's defense and security forces in a proxy war against Russia. This is a war that is likely to continue if the transatlantic nations have any say in the matter. Uh, this was made clear by testimony given by the Director of National Intelligence, Averill Haynes, to the Senate Armed Forces Committee, Armed Services Committee on May 10th. She said the U.S. is prepared for a long war of attrition as U.S. intelligence agencies, quote, do not see a viable negotiating push forward. I'm sorry, negotiating path forward, unquote. Well, the reason they don't see it is because the U.S. is committed to a long war. The, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy as the Biden administration and the NATO allies have made clear to Zelensky that he must keep the war going to the last Ukrainian and the West will accommodate that <coughs> by an escalating flow of weapons and support, including intelligence support because the Anglo-Americans do not want a diplomatic settlement. This is about defending the unipolar world. Now, in yesterday's report, I went through the cracks that are appearing in the facade of unity uh, of NATO. There is a global realignment underway. And tomorrow, I'll report to you a very striking development that occurred in last weekend's elections in the Philippines, where the anti-colonial forces elected the son of former President Ferdinand Marcos, overturning the regime change coup run by George Shultz, the International Monetary Fund and the economic hitmen of Wall Street and London that overthrew the Marcos regime in February 1986. This is part of the realignment which is underway. Why India and Indonesia and South Africa and Brazil and other countries are not supporting the U.S. NATO sanctions against Russia. It's why many nations in Africa are refusing to vote in the United Nations to, by siding with the NATO bloc, and why there's a potential, because of this, for a realignment to break with the policies of not only global NATO, but of the Great Reset, the attempt by Western financial institutions to eliminate national sovereignty on the planet and to establish global institutions which have power over the decisions made by any nation which might wish to support its population. This is what the fight is about. This is why Russia is targeted. This is why China is targeted. This is why now India is becoming targeted because there are powerful nations with large populations which refuse to submit to the demand that they surrender their sovereignty to global financial institutions, to institutions such as the World Trade Organization, the uh, COP26 climate conference, and so on. But nations that are aspiring to an independent future, which could be realized through cooperation for economic development with the United States and European nations. Now, this is occurring as the financial system is imploding. 
Just take, for example, the headline of Axios News yesterday, quote, the markets are in a panic mode, unquote, because the physical economy has been destroyed. And they're defending a, an economic policy that benefits speculators, that benefits global financial institutions over and above the needs and interests of people of nations around the world. We need a common policy of economic development because that's the way you achieve peace in the world. And I would urge people to go to the link at the bottom of the description page where we have, well, I'll be posting a link to the LaRouche plan for a new economic architecture. This is the way to avoid war, not sending weapons and threaten to use nuclear weapons against nations which refuse to surrender their sovereignty. Now, tomorrow I'll take your questions, uh, besides talking about the importance of the Philippines elections. If you have questions, send them to me at harleysch at gmail.com. And don't forget to sign up uh, for our uh, notifications on our website. See you tomorrow.